Um, I work for the Ministry of Health as an environmental health practitioner. Um, I've been doing this work for the last 25 years, eh? I look very young, I know, but I have the experience. Uh, I did 15 years at community level, and I've been with the policy formulation aspect within the last 10 years. So I think we can start. I'm here just to take you through what actually the Liberal Declaration is. Um, and it, what it's all about and what informs the Libreville Declaration and why the concern and they ended up being the Libreville Declaration in 2008. Um, like we all know, environment is one of the primary determinants of health, individual and community health for that matter. And when you talk about the environment, you're talking to the physical, the chemical, the biological, the, the chemical and the biologic risks in the environment that can harm human health. And then, like we all know that data has shown that nearly a quarter of all deaths in Africa are reportedly due to environmental uh, causes. And this is from the WHO. And I just wanted to share with you this picture just to show you how the environment actually impacts human health and the issues that we actually look at when you talk environmental determinants of health. And you talk, we talk to issues of air pollution, inadequate water and sanitation and hygiene issues, chemicals, including biological agents, radiation, community noise, um, occupational risks, that's the labor aspect, agricultural practices, including pesticide use, water reuse, and thereof, built environments, housing and roads, and climate change. So those are some of the impacts. It's not all of them. They're not this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just to give guidance on what is it that we talk about when we talk about the environmental determinants of health. Because if you break down all these elements, you'd realize that there's so much more actually within each component, right from air pollution down to climate change, that we need to take into consideration as you assess uh, issues of uh, environmental determinants of health. And then that this is just to show you the impact globally of the environmental disease burden. It's at 24%, and this is information from the 2022 uh, Global Strategy on um, Health, Environment, and Climate Change as developed by WHO. And you can see that as the Africa region, we are at at least 2.5 million people die from environmental disease burden annually. Um, the Liberal Declaration. Um, the Liberal Declaration was conceptualized in 2008 by UNEP and WHO, and it was led by the African Ministers of Health and Environment, taking into cognizance the effects that the environmental determinants of health have on the ultimate health of the people. And like I've already said before, most of the issues that we are battling with were what we call infectious diseases. Like I said, that other um, slide or the, the pictogram that I, I showed do not actually was not include, did not indicate issues of infectious disease or communicable disease as we talk as we discuss them. And when you talk co infectious or communicable disease, we include zoonotic diseases. So that is how we discuss it from the health perspective. And then the other issues are like what we, we know the traditional issues and other issues like air pollution, tobacco smoke, and chemicals are driving the disease burden when it comes to STDs nowadays. An estimated 28% of all premature deaths are attributed to environmental um, factors in the Africa region. And that is why the ministers of health and environment specifically got together to say, what is it that we can do? What strategy can we come up with to actually manage the health and environment uh, risks? And the other thing that was quite pivotal in the establishment of the um, the declaration was that 50% of the vital ecosystem services of the planet are being degraded, hey? Or are being subjected to excessive pressures, that is the services that maintain the quality of life, I mean the quality of air, land and water resources were actually being impacted. And these are the top strong causes of death from the environment. Um, and that, and this is in the 
African region. We can see that it's ischemic, um, ischemic heart diseases, and here we are talking issues of, of which, are, uh, which, are, which are contributed by air pollution, and then chronic respiratory diseases. It's also issues of air pollution here as well. And then the various cancers, I mean, we use a lot of pesticides, a lot of chemicals, uh, irradiation exposures, you can name it. Those are some of the contributing factors to cancers. And then your unintentional injuries, especially within the labor sector or occupational health um, issues. And um, respiratory infections, you know, you talk about TB. People usually assume that TB is not environment related, but the how part, the how you live, how you survive, um, the earlier speakers talked to issues of health going beyond just, just about the physical aspect, but uh, it's more about the environment that one lives in. So you find that diseases such as the TB is promoted primarily about where the one person resides or the kind of housing structure that that person lives in. Diarrheal diseases, we know that it's, it, 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 it's, um, uh, it's my mainly contributed to by issues of water sanitation and hygiene. Malaria, vector-borne diseases, the neg neglected tropical diseases that were being discussed earlier. Diabetes is an NCD. Where people s live, uh, you realize that they don't even have space to actually do any physical activity. So those are some physical activity, and they don't even have a small patch of land where they are able to grow their own food for survival or to keep healthy, if I'm going to put it that way. And then the neonatal conditions. Here we are talking issues of... Um, in, in certain environments, you'd realize that there's what you call Klebsiella in the hospital settings. And it's been found that most neonatal conditions are, are caused by this uh, particular um, pathogen, which is as resultant from poor uh, hygienic conditions within the hospital settings. And Libravo Declaration uh, itself had 11 action points in, in conceptualization which was establishing health and environment strategic alliances. That is taking to cognizance the institutions, existing institutions within countries to see how best can we ensure that even though these institutions exist, how do we bring them together to ensure that they fit back amongst, amongst each other? And then there was development of the national frameworks, development or strengthening is either you develop as a country or you strengthen what is it that is existing to close the gaps. Um, poverty reduction through national and environment programs, because we know that in the Africa region, we are hard hit by poverty, and we cannot ignore it when we discuss issues of health and environment. And then the capacity building of health and environment institutions or organizations, this was one of the key action areas as well. Promote knowledge acquisition, that is research around health and environment issues. That's why we brought in academic and research institutions to actually facilitate or support this particular aspect, to see what is it that they are doing. And then establishment of and strengthening of health and environment surveillance systems. You know that a lot of institutions do have surveillance systems, but the, the, the surveillance systems don't actually fit back on each other. We realize that health has its own surveillance system. Agri uh, what do you call us? We call it agriculture back home, so I'm used to, I, I want to say, Animal health has its own surveillance system. Wildlife has its own surveillance system. Ecosystem health has its own surveillance system. We never sit, sit down together to say, how best can we manage the issues that are emanating from the surveillance systems that we have? Or how do we fit back? And that is why the Libre Declaration kind of um, advocated for. And then there was, it also advocated for the establishment of national mechanisms for assessing compliance to conventions, treaties, and protocols for protection of human health. Here, what actually happened was that the, the, the declaration takes cognizance of existing conventions, treaties, and protocols globally that talk to protection of the health and environment. So we have to ensure that if countries are signatories to these protocols, conventions, and treaties, that ensure that there is compliance to it. How far are we as a country with regards to complying to that? And then there was establishment of this, establishment or a strengthening of national monitoring and evaluation mechanisms. Like I said earlier, there are surveillance systems, there are ME systems within countries, but the information is not shared among the sectors. 
And then the, where there was need, there was need to establish a systematic assessment for evaluation of health and environment risk. Like, for example, I believe you are all aware of the environment, environmental outlook reports. I know that a lot of countries used to do them. I don't know if you are, most of the African countries are still doing, but this is one way of us establishing the risks from um, this, the, the establishing the risks as outlined uh, or as guided by the Libreville um, Declaration. And then it also advocates for development of partnerships and advocacy programming amongst these institutions, these organizations, and then ensuring establishment of budget allocation for inter intersectoral collaboration. So if countries had all this in place, or if countries did a, a situation analysis and needs assessment, they would come with the appropriate national joint plan of action to actually address these issues, or a plan that would say, going forward, as Botswana, as country X, this is how we are going to do it. And then I'm just gonna give you a Botswana perspective. This is the country coordinating mechanism, or the country coordinating team in Botswana. It's made up of um, diverse departments, organizations, civil society, civil society organizations, uh, academic institutions, and you name it. And it's coordinated by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment. And commitments by these ministries was done at um, ministerial level, like I said before. And before we did anything, we had to sit down and identify what we call, uh, uh, identify the environmental determinants of health or the environmental risks in Botswana that impacted on human health. So as this team there, we sat together, we did that and, and came up with our risks, internal risks, and rated them accordingly. And then, like I said, there was an established country coordinating mechanism and it has about 35 members but we keep on adding where they need, where we realize that there are gaps or areas which are not really measured. And it's more of a whole of government approach. It's a more of a whole of, a whole of government approach. It's not only limited to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment. Um, we, we had, like I said, we identified the risks and then we brought in everybody concerned to help us drive the National Plan of Joint Action. And then the multi-sectoral it, the team is multisexual and in multisexual and, and multidisciplinary team. And the team develops its own terms of reference to say, how are we going to be functioning? What are the issues of concern which are informed the, the, by the situation analysis that was conducted? I think I missed something. Okay. Uh, progress so far in Botswana, we undertook the situation analysis and needs assessment, and that is the report that we, un we did in 2013, and developed the national plan of joint action. And in 2022, the Africa region updated its strategy, the Liberal Declaration updated our strategy. So in 2023, we decided as a country that we are going to review our situation analysis and needs assessment. So we are right now in the process of do, reviewing the situation analysis and uh, needs assessment, and that is 10 years later. We are about to complete it. Uh, we're in the meeting last week to actually do this, to do the review. Um, and what are the opportunities or benefits? It's effective action for the management of environmental risks across sectors. Cost effectiveness, it's much cheaper for government because we bring everybody who, 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 who needs to be there together to actually make decisions, whether it be it policy or not so ever. And then there's no duplication of efforts. Ease of collaboration and partnerships. Right now, if you at all there's an issue, you know exactly who to contact, who to talk to in another sector or within another ministry. And then the benefits are obviously, when you have a healthy environment, you're looking at a healthy population. Challenges and limitations. Yes, there are those that still don't understand the concept, and there are silo approaches to certain uh, health and environment issues. And then we still have limited funding. We are yet to have a, a, a appropriate funding mechanism because the whole essence of this liberal is that it be anchored at the highest level, like in the VP's office, for example. So that is what we are saying. So we are yet to sign MOUs to ensure um, all the members involved actually 
commit to what is inside the study. And it's currently being led at technical director's level. And our hope and wish it should is that it should be at the level of the VP's office. And this is just to say, in closing, adoption of a One Health approach, which is a holistic infrastructure and multidisciplinary is highly recommended in the implementation of the liberalism strategy to ensure effectiveness of the health and environment strategic alliance. And this is a quote from the regional strategy for the Africa region of 2022. Thank you.